there. Okay, I think I've got all the announcements. How about the introducing our speaker? Dennis is here. In fact, it was a little over a year ago that we last had Dennis Larson with us here at the Schmidt House, and his talk about the Natchez Pass was very well received. And so by popular demand, we asked him to come back and... Uh, this this season of monthly talks and so he we well he's a retired high school teacher was it yelm district yelm okay a member of octa which is the oregon california trails association member of the puyallup historical society used to be i think the ezra meeker historical society and our tumwater historical association he's a member of that also for more than 10 years now, he's researched, written, and lectured about Pacific Northwest pioneers. In fact, Dennis and our archives curator, Karen Johnson, have collaborated on a couple of uh, history books about Edward J. Allen. So uh, I think those are some of those are still on the table in the back. Uh, perhaps his favorite historic Northwest figure to research and write about is Ezra Meeker. And uh, his books on him include The Missing Chapters, Slick as a Mitten, and today's focus, Hop King, Ezra Meeker's Boom Years. And uh, so let's have a warm historic welcome for Dennis Larson. Let's see if we can get this mic set so it's correct. Okay, can you hear me fine? Okay, um, we're here in the Schmidt House, built by beer. I'm going to ask you guys not to put up your hand, but you know, just confess to yourself. I'm sure most of us in here at some time in our lives have tipped a schooner of beer, correct? Okay. Um, one of the ingredients in that beer is hops. What do they do? Who can tell me? Seasoning. Seasoning? Anything else they do? it does? Fermenting? No, it doesn't do with the fermenting. Historically, what hops do Oh, somebody way back here? Ah, that was the number one thing. It was a preservative. Uh, when beer first came out, before they started using hops, the shelf life of a bottle of beer was just weeks, and then it would spoil and you, it was undrinkable. When they started using hops, they discovered that the shelf life increased drastically. Uh, the other thing that hops does is gives beer that unique little taste, you know, that you kind of like. And so, the guy I'm going to talk about today was the premier hop grower in Washington history. He was at one point probably the wealthiest guy in the territory. He lost it all at the end of his uh, career here, which I'll be telling you about. And he uh, became the largest exporter of hops in the United States. And he helped transform Washington territory into a state by bringing in more money than you could imagine. And I mean, he brought in millions to the territory. And so I'm going to be talking primarily today about his career as a hop king. Okay, he was uh, the largest exporter of hops in the United States. And I'm primarily going to be talking about his career as a hop king. But in the book, there are many other things that Ezra Meeker did throughout his life that weren't related to hops that were very notable. Uh, I'm not going to have time today to talk to about his role in the woman suffrage movement. But he was one of the major players behind the scenes in the woman's suffrage movement. His wife actually uh, hobnobbed with Susan B. Anthony and people like that. And I'm not going to get to talk about his run for Congress. He actually did run for Congress. And he also started an oil business in the Puyallup Valley. Standard Oil sort of, it was, he put that into the name of the company. They even had oil wells out there in the Puyallup Valley, and that's all in there. So, so there's a lot of fun things that I don't get to talk about today. Now, um, I first met Ezra Meeker way back in 1996. My wife and I were on a road trip going through the Blue Mountains in Eastern Oregon, and we stopped at Immigrant Spring State Park. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with where that is, but when you come up from Pendleton and you come up into the mountains, going down to La Grande on the other side, it's a state park that's right up at the top. And there was an or it's along the Oregon Trail. And there was a kiosk there, told about the Oregon Trail, and one of the panels had Ezra Meeker's story, which I had never heard. And it said that this guy who was 75 years old took a covered wagon and ox team and went east over the Oregon Trail. And he put up monuments along the way at important places. And it said, one of these monuments is right outside the park. So my wife and I went looking for it. And after a little bit of search, we found it. 
And Pat turned to me and she says, I wonder where the rest of the monuments are. Well, <laughs> nearly two decades later, <laughs> and you know, it, the, the search for the monuments is complete. It's just expanded a little bit. Now, no, let's see if I can figure out. Okay. Uh, no complete biography about Ezra Meeker's life has ever been written, perhaps because he lived a jam-packed 98 years, and perhaps because he wrote so many books himself about various aspects of his life, or perhaps the persona that he created um, in his quest to save the Oregon Trail turned historians away. He, he was pretty much a showman, and uh, I think that turned off a few people. Now, I had no intention of writing a biography when I was standing there in the Blue Mountains way back in 1999, but stuff happens. <laughs> and nearly two decades later, I've written four volumes <laughs> of that biography. Now, chronologically, Hop King should have been my very first volume, but it was the third. And uh, it's the topic of today's talk. Now, for those of you guys who are interested in other parts of his life story, I suggest you read one of the many books that Meeker wrote. Uh, one of them that I would highly recommend is called The Busy Life of 85 Years of Ezra Meeker, or choose one of those up there in the first line. Or if you want, you can choose my volumes, which are the bottom ones up here. Any of those would give you a good history of Ezra. Okay. No, wrong arrow. No, right arrow. Okay. Meeker arrived in Portland in October 1852 after coming over the Oregon Trail with his wife Eliza Jane and his infant son Marion and his brother Oliver. And they stayed in Kalama, Washington, just briefly, built a cabin and stayed there for the winter. And then they moved up here to Puget Sound. And they settled on McNeil Island. And they stayed there until 1854 when their father arrived after coming over the Oregon Trail, Jacob Meeker. And he paddled out there in November to join his sons and he said, I didn't come across the continent in a covered wagon with an ox team to live on an island, guys. <laughs> he said, I want to live in the mainland where there are people. And so the children were obedient, and they moved to the mainland. And they took out um, donation land claims in the Fern Hill District of Tacoma. And if you see the freeway in the bottom, Puyallup's on the far end over there to my left, and Lakewood's in this end. And Portland Avenue goes right up through the, the pink and the purple. And so the pink guy is Oliver, the older brother who came in 1852 with Ezra. And Ezra's is the one in purple up there at the top. And then their sister Hannah's off here to the left. Now where'd the father go? He went way over in South Tacoma, where 96th Street is, where the old Starlight Drive-In Theater used to be. And so they stayed there from 1855 to 1862. Now I begin the book in Stellicum, and the first few chapters I follow the Meekers to their new homes in the Puyallup Valley. And along the way I tell a few stories that aren't generally known. One of them is about Jim Meeker. Jim was a, a Native American, a Snohomish Indian, and he was a young boy, and his relatives brought him down to Stellicum in canoes, and th they went up to Meeker and said, how would you like a slave? And Ezra said, no, <laughs> I wouldn't like a slave. And he says, but if Jim wants to move in with me, he can. But it's got to be his decision. So uh, Ezra and his wife talked to, his name was Sayak, his Indian name. And he said, yeah, I'll come. And so they informally adopted him. And they raised him to adulthood. And when they moved to Puyallup, Jim went with them and he got married to a native woman and built a cabin right next to the Meekers. Now we don't have any pictures of Jim, but we've got a picture of his son here. His name is Jerry Meeker and he became an attorney in Tacoma and a very famous Indian activist. He fought for Native American rights all over the place. Now I think most of you probably know the story of Leshai, but might, what might not be so familiar to you is the story of his two trials. Uh, the first trial was held in Stellicum, and two people voted to acquit him, ten voted to convict him. Now, he was accused of murdering somebody, and we'll get to that in a minute here. Uh, 
One of the people that uh, said, I'm not going to acquit him, was Ezra Meeker. He was on the jury. And he said that the pro he's not going to convict him. I don't mean acquit. <laughs> and he was on the jury, and he said the prime witness, Antonio Rabison, committed perjury. And he says I, he just knew it. The other person was a guy named Kincaid, and he said, if Leshai killed anyone, it was during a war. And when you kill somebody in a war, he says, that's not murder. And so everybody thought that, you know, that's just how it went out, because the second trial was held in Olympia. And that trial was supposedly a slam dunk. They thought maybe he would have a much better chance of getting a conviction in Olympia than they would in Stellicum. And hidden in the Meeker papers is this. J.P. Eckler, one of the jurors of the second trial of Leshai, voted against conviction at first, and two others joined me. But they finally pers were persuaded to vote guilty. So that second trial, which historians think was just a slam dunk, actually there were more people originally voting to acquit Leshai than uh, the one at Stellicum that Meeker's you know, more well known about. Now this is a picture of Leshai that Meeker created, and it's on a postcard that he made. And on the back of the postcard, he tells the story of Leshai, and he argues that he was judicially murdered. And in his uh, book, Pioneer Reminiscences, Meeker actually names Antonio Rabison and says he committed perjury. And it caused quite a firestorm because he also accused the governor of the state of Washington, of Washington Territory, of being a drunkard and being, you know, primarily responsible for starting the Indian War. So, and during that Indian War, everybody fled to Fort Stellicum or the city of Stellicum. And the Meekers fled from their farms out in Swamp Place, out in Fern Hill to Stellicum, and they opened a store. And they ran that store in Stellicum for a few years, and this is the store over here. And this is Commercial Street in Stellicum. And the um, store is on the right. You kind of just see the front of it there. And today that's an apartment building with a parking lot. It's all gone. But in 1859, what the Meekers decided to do was pool all the money that they had and send Oliver down to San Francisco to buy supplies and stock for the store and cut out the middleman that they'd been paying. And th this was going to be their you know, solution to you know, making some money. But everything that could go wrong went wrong. Coming uh, north with all that stuff in the bottom of the ship, the northerner struck a rock off Cape Mendocino in Northern California and it sank. And Oliver drowned. And with Oliver went all the money. Now, 38 people died in that accident. 14 are buried in a mass grave only two were identified, and that Oliver wasn't one of the two. Uh, Oliver could be in the mass grave, or his body could have washed out to sea. Now, for the next two years, Ezra tried to make a go of it at Swamp Place. His, that's what he called his farm, which gives you an idea what he thought of it. <laughs> and he failed. Um, the crops wouldn't grow. He tried to start a soap business in Stellicum. That didn't work. He uh, imported apples from the Huntington family down in Longview. That didn't work. And so in 1862, he finally gave up on Stellicum and said, we're moving to the Puyallup Valley. And he was as broke as you could imagine. And 10 years later, he was on the edge of unimagined riches. Now, a simple plant created an explosion of wealth that helped transform Washington Territory into a state and Ezra Meeker was at the epicenter of that explosion. Let's look at the source of this money. These are hop plants. They start growing in April. And in September, these berries or cones are picked. And from these little tiny humble berries, an economic giant emerged. Now, how did the Puyallup hop uh, industry get started? Meeker told his version of the story in this book, Hop Culture. He wrote it in 1883, and he gave credit to his father as being the first one to grow hops in the Puyallup Valley. But there was a neighbor, Levant Thompson, and he claimed he grew them first. And Thompson's farm was right next to Jacob Meeker's farm, 
And so, you know, it, the question of who was first, I sort out in the book in rather entertaining detail. And the one thing I can tell you is everybody lied. <laughs> Now, here's what I think happened. Uh, this is John Valentine Meeker. This is Ezra's older brother. He came from Stellicum carrying a bag of hop roots that had been given to him by an Olympia brewer. Uh, and the guy's name was Isaac Wood, and the guy who founded uh, Lacey. And he had a brewery here in Olympia. And he carried those hop roots to the valley and gave them to his father. And his father thought so much of them that he planted them in the rows of trees in his orchard just between the trees. Didn't even think they deserved their own field. And he made $150 off those things that year, which doesn't sound like much, but that was more money than anyone else in the Puyallup Valley made. And it sort of drew attention. The next year he planted two acres and he made uh, $600. And the next year he built a kiln and planted four acres. And then in 1869, after he'd shipped his crop to Portland, he died. Now, Ezra didn't start growing hops until 1868, two years after his father. And Levant Thompson didn't start growing hops until 1867, one year after Jacob. So Jacob Meeker is the guy who I give credit to for starting the hop business in the Puyallup Valley. And believe it or not, Ezra also gave his father credit, although he did put in a little note in one of the books that when, when John went by with that bag of hop roots, I pulled a couple out and quickly planted them. So <laughs> maybe I was first. <laughs> okay, here's where everybody lived. This is the Puyallup River, and it bends and goes down to the bottom of the screen. And the Stuck River is coming in from the top uh, of the screen up there. And Sumner's to the right there. And you can see the Thompson Farm and Jacob Meeker's farm. They're in what's today's Sumner. And Ezra Meeker is in downtown Puyallup, and his brother John Valentine is right next to him there. Now, take a look in the background of this picture. You see those little trees that are growing back there? That's how they grew hops back in Ezra's day. They would plant a pole in the ground and then train the vine up the pole. The poles were about 12 feet tall. And Ezra eventually had 500 acres of hops growing. That was 50,000 poles that he had to plant on his own farm. Now, that's not counting everyone else. You can imagine how labor intensive this was. This was not just, you know, get out there and have five or six people take care of the hop field. This was really labor intensive. And then to pick the hops, they had to lower those poles so they could get at the cones. So in the spring, you put up 50,000 poles. And in the fall, you lower 50,000 poles. And, uh, you know, and they're all 12 feet tall. And you'll notice in this picture, there are boxes kind of on the wagon and some scattered around. You can see the hop uh, vines in the back there. They look like miniature trees. Actually, they look like big trees. And you picked about two or three of these a day, and you got a dollar a box. Now, by 1893, they had figured out that this raising and lowering 50,000 poles was you know, not the good thing to do. And so they started training the hops on wires. And the advantage of that is that you can just simply lower the wires and get at the hop cones. But that came much later. Now, once they picked the hops, they were taken to kilns where they were baked. On the right here is Meeker's very first kiln, what it looked like. And on the left is one of his you know, later kilns. Gives you an idea he modernized a little bit. And then after they were dried, they were put in bales or bags like this. And they were 180 pounds for each bag. And these are some scenes from Harper's Magazine of the Puyallup Valley in 1888. And here you have the Native Americans coming in their canoes to help pick the hops. And then you have the, the trees or the hop poles being lowered. And then you have a picture of a kiln. There are a couple of these kilns still around. This one's out in Fall City, in a little city park. And there's another one in Alder, Alderton, which is just a little bit east of Puyallup. Now, Meeker incorporated in 1867. 
This was an umbrella company that encompassed his father, his brothers, his stepmother, you know, and himself. And it was mostly initially a farm. Yeah, I mean, you know, they grew cattle and corn and things like that. And it wasn't until much later that hops became the focus of it. I mean, he incorporated a year before he even planted any hops, unless you believe he stole some out of that bag and stuck them in the ground. And uh, I also mentioned earlier that in that 1869, when he took that, when Jacob Meeker took that crop down to Portland and died, Ezra had to go down and deal with that. He was the executor of his father's estate, and he had to take care of that. And he met Henry Weinhardt, who was the premier Oregon brewer at the time. And he sold those hops to Henry, and he signed a long-term contract with Henry. And the advantage of that long-term contract was it shielded him from pl price fluctuations. Hops were notorious for bouncing up and down like a yo-yo, not just from year to year, but even during the course of the season. Uh, they could be at 10 cents a pound, just barely above the cost of production. They could go up to 20, 25 cents a pound. Then they could drop back down to four. And Ezra, with that long-term contract, he planted 20 acres just to fill Weinhard's needs alone. And he didn't have to worry about that yo-yo. I mean, so he was able to get started under an umbrella of security. In 1870, he printed the very first book that was published here in Washington Territory. And he uh, talks in that book about all the industries that are here in the Puget Sound area. Sawmills galore, coal mining. There's not one word about hops in there. Now, he'd been growing hops for two years. And you know his father had been growing them you know, since 1866. But in 1870, it was such a minor industry that he didn't even think it merited mention. Now, how did the growers pay for all this? Uh, they didn't have a lot of capital. And so what Meeker did was he went to some rich friends that he knew, primarily guys that owned sawmills around Puget Sound, and he mortgaged his land with them each year. He would mortgage it in the spring, take the money, plant the hops, go through the harvest, and then at the end of the year after he sold the hops, he would pay off the mortgage. Now, people who didn't have rich friends had to go to the bank. And there was only one bank that was willing to loan money for such an enterprise. And that was Portland's uh, Corbett and McClay. And it worked the same way. They, they would borrow from the bank in the spring, and after they sold their crop, they would pay the loan back in the fall. Now, in 1871, there were just four people growing hops. That's, you know, not very many. Ezra, his brother John, Mr. Thompson, and J.P. Stewart. The next year, a dozen more jumped in, and the hop business was about to take off. Now, you have to sell them if you're going to make some money. And the only way that you could make money was to sell your hops in the East Coast. And to get them there, you had to send your hops down to San Francisco, put them on the Transcontinental Railroad here, and go across to the big network of railroads in the East Coast. There is a disadvantage to this, because we picked the hops in September, and they would dry them and bag them and everything in October, and in November, they would ship them to San Francisco. That requires a sea voyage. November is not a great time to jump out onto the Pacific Ocean. And a lot of ships had trouble out there, and some sank. Now, what the growers did was they pooled their hops together. They didn't, it wasn't like every single grower took their hops down to San Francisco. They would pool them, and one guy would take them down there. And then he was in charge of marketing them. In 1875, George Vining was the unlucky soul that got that job. He was the postmaster at Sumner, and he was also a hop grower, and the Pacific that, which is shown here, the steamer Pacific, collided with another ship as it was coming out of the Straits of Juan de Fuca, and it sank. And Vining was last seen down in the hold trying to rescue those precious hops. The, as I mentioned earlier, the growing of hops was really ex, you know, in, extremely labor intensive. And since the white population here in the territory in the 1870s and 1880s was small, the growers turned to the Native Americans to solve their labor needs. Up to 6,000 came each September. 
and they came from as far away as Alaska. One year, Meeker even went up to Prince Rupert to recruit Native Americans to come down. And they came in canoes like this with the whole family, and they would come up the Puyallup River and land at the reservation, and the growers would meet them with their wagons, and they would take them out to their fields. And this is what Meeker's hop fields looked like. There's the hop plants in the background back there, and all the tents are the Native American encampment. Now, think about this for a second. In the 1870s, what's going on in the Great Plains? The Great Plains Indian Wars. Think George Armstrong Custer. Think Chief Joseph. Two decades earlier, we had a war here in Puget Sound with the Native Americans, and 6,000 of them are coming in each September. How did we avoid trouble? Well, it was mutually beneficial for everybody to behave for one month. <laughs> The growers absolutely had to have the Native Americans or their crops wouldn't get picked. The Native Americans were living on reservations and they were really hurting for money and they needed the money. And the merchants in town really liked it because the Native Americans, as they would go back to the reservations, they would spend a lot of that money that they just earned. And so for one month, we could all behave. Now, that's not to say everything was smooth. I mean, there were problems, but nothing serious. Now, Meeker did something else that I thought was kind of unique. He paid $1 for each child that was born in his hop yards uh, during the picking season. And one year, he said he paid out $7. Now, can you picture these, you know, some of these pregnant ladies saying, we got to just hold out for a couple more days? <laughs> In uh, the 1870s, a second group came to help pick the hops, and they weren't welcomed. They were the Chinese, and their number one sin was they stayed. They didn't leave at the end of the month. When the Transcontinental Railroad was finished, the, a lot of the Chinese workers that worked on the railroad drifted to, to Washington Territory, and they went to work picking hops. And by the mid-1880s, uh, anti-Chinese movement had grown all over the West. It was quite violent. People were killed. And eventually, the folks in Tacoma in particular expelled the Chinese from Pierce County, just put them on trains and kicked them out, burned their houses down. Ezra Meeker fought tooth and nail for their rights, but he lost. And I tell this story in the book in much more detail. Now, a another hazard was uh, the competition for pickers was so intense that folks started burning down people's hop barns and kilns. That way you would free up the, the laborers to come to your place. And in the 1870s, this became sort of an epidemic. Ezra actually hired a night watchman, and that's how he managed to save his from being burned. By 1873, Two years after he, uh, t 11 years after he had uh, left Puyallup, had left Stellicum for Puyallup, I mean, he was wealthy. He was rich. You know, he, he arrived in the Puyallup Valley, broke, and within a decade, he's rich. And he started another store. Uh, right there, that building with the false front, and you can't quite see the banner on top, but it has his name up there. And uh, he, that's followed the stores that he built in Stellicum, and he also built one in Tacoma. This is an advertisement for his store, just to give you an idea of some of the things that he sold. And this is Ezra on the left standing here by the wagon. He's the one all alone over there in 1882. And this is the year that hop prices exploded. They went to over a dollar a pound. Everybody who was growing hops became obscenely wealthy very quick. A lot of them became millionaires, and Ezra was one of those. Now, the next year, the Northern Pacific Railroad reached Puget Sound, and this allowed Meeker to do something that he'd been wanting to do for a long time, separate Washington hops from California hops. He was convinced that Washington hops were superior. He'd even hired a chemist to prove it. And the problem was that when all those things got sent down to San Francisco, all the Washington hops and the Oregon hops and the California hops were just put in one basket, sent east, and they were just called Pacific Coast hops. And he didn't like that. He wanted a label, Northwest hops. 
and he succeeded in 1883 in doing that. The next year, that same year, he started a brokerage business and he, with his uh, son-in-law here, Eben Osborne, and he had offices all through Western Washington, all through Oregon, and even down into California. And he would buy hops from other growers and ship them up to Puyallup, and then he would dry them in his kilns, and he would bag them in his factories, and then he would ship them east. He put his relatives, relatives to work as buying agents. Uh, the guy on the left is his son-in-law. He was in charge of the Willamette Valley. The guy on the right is his nephew, and he was in charge of Southwest Washington. Everything was done with a contract, a legally binding contract. So those folks out in the field, the agents, would be buying hops, signing contracts with the growers, and you know everything was done legal. That didn't mean they stayed out of court, <laughs> but it was all done legally. Now, to communicate back and forth between the, um, you know, the buyers in the, out in the field and the head office in Puyallup, they had to use the telegraph. You know, there weren't telephones back then, and you know, mail was pretty slow. And the problem is that the telegraph lines could be hacked. You know, it's not nothing new. I mean, they've been hacking forever. <laughs> and Ezra decided that they would do everything in code. He, this is a copy of his code book here the original code books in the Meeker papers in Tacoma. And he, Meeker said once that he got a telegram that was, you know, like several pages long, and he said, I spent hours, you know, transcribing this thing and decoding it. And then being a bit of a showman, once those hops started east on the Northern Pacific Railroad, he made sure that the boxcars didn't go like this empty. He had a big banner that went on each car that said, E. Meeker and Company Hops. And so as that train made its way all the way across the country, everybody knew where the hops came from. And at the end of the year, he would publish a handbook or an annual. And it would be, a, it's just a little tiny booklet, and it would describe how the hop picking season went and make a prediction for the next year. And he also had some little ideas in there about how to do a better job of growing hops. In 1884, he made his first trip to London. Before he's done with the London hop trade, he has become the largest exporter of hops in the United States, and he has brought countless millions of dollars into Western Washington. And it all started because of a misunderstanding on those three letters that are up there, CIF. And here's what happened. He sent a small sample to England to just see if, test the market, see what they would say. And he got a telegram back, said, we'll buy your hops for $10,000 CIF. Well, he didn't know what CIF meant. And te uh, transatlantic telegrams cost a dollar a word. So he sent this message, please repeat. They answered, $10,000 CIF. <laughs> well, he said, well, I guess that's clear enough. And he took the note to the bank and drew a draft note on for $10,000. And a couple weeks later, he got a bill from England for $2,000. And he was absolutely incensed. And he immediately headed for London. He stopped off in New York on the way, and he asked the, the New York people that were growing hops, he says, what, what's this CIF stuff? And they said, that means clear of insurance and freight. You were supposed to pay the insurance and those hops and the freight costs. So you owe him $2,000. He learned the hard way. Well, he got on this ship, the Ariana, and he made it across the Atlantic and went to England. And this is where he went. He went to the London Hop Exchange, or the borough, and it had a big glass dome over the top of it, and these are offices kind of around it. And what they would do is they wouldn't take all the hops, you know, like a whole bale and put out on the table. They'd just take a sample. And the English growers and buyers and such would take a look at the samples and bid and make offers. They did this in February and March, which in England is about as gloomy as it is here in February and March. That's why the glass dome, so they can you know, get a little more light on it. Off to the left is what the place looks like today. Uh, the, it, the top part was destroyed in World War II during the German bombing. And uh, it's not a hop exchange anymore, it's just an office building. 
Now here's another story I cover in the book. Uh, Meeker made a second trip to Europe in 1886, right at the close of the New Orleans World's Fair. He was the Washington Territory Commissioner to the New Orleans World's Fair. He was in charge of getting the exhibit there. And his wife, Eliza Jane, was named the Lady Commissioner. And they're sitting up here at the front table, Eliza Jane and then Ezra, and that's their daughter, Olive, over there and sitting on the other end of the table. And if you look in the background, these are all the things that Ezra rounded up from Washington Territory to take to the World's Fair. And you'll see a hop kiln back there. And what else do you see back there? Hop plants, don't you? He was going to make sure that the world knew where the hops were coming from. When he was absent, he put his sons, Marion and Fred, to work, and his wife also, and they ran the business when he was away, and he was away a lot. In 1890, these little critters showed up. Now, Europe and the East Coast, New York, had been fighting hop lice forever. They knew that all you had to do was spray to kill these guys, and you, know, you could deal with them. The West Coast had not seen a hop louse ever. They made their way here on those empty train cars that were coming back. And in 1890, they showed up simultaneously from British Columbia down to Oregon and to California. And our, our competitive advantage disappeared because other people were having to pay to fight these guys. We didn't have to. Now, mo a lot of historians say this is what did in Meeker and the hop business here in Washington. Not true. Uh, it damaged it, but it didn't destroy it. Meeker sent his son, Fred, to England to learn all he could about hop spraying. And this is Ezra off here to the right, holding on to the machine. And they didn't like this English machine very much, so they built their own. And you see how it has five nozzles there that spray? They reached up to about eight feet. How tall were those poles? 50,000 of them had to have the top four feet cut off. Oh. Now, what, this is what he used for an insecticide. It's an a emulsion created from the bark of a quassia tree, which is a South American tree. And Meeker bought tons and tons of this stuff, and it, it produced the emulsion that he used to spray. He'd spray sometimes six times a year in his fields. Now, there were growers out there that couldn't afford to do that. And if they couldn't afford to do that, then they got hurt. But if they could afford to spray, they could handle the hop lice. Now, not everybody thought that the lice were a bad thing. There was a Reverend Hansen, who was a Methodist minister in Puyallup, who had gone to a conference in Seattle. And he announced at that conference that the hop lice had invaded the hop crops of the Kent and Puyallup Valley, and they were going to be destroyed. And the audience greeted it with shouts of approval. Meeker responded with sort of a snarky letter to the PI, in which he announced that he had 500 acres of lice-free hops growing in the valleys, and he had beaten the curse with an emulsion of whale oil soap and quassia sprayed on the vines. And then he went on to do, I want to remind the good reverend that a good portion of this money for the church in which he has been preaching for the last year came from the proceeds of that cursed hop. And I would appreciate it if the good reverend would ease his guilty conscience by returning the money. <laughs> well, this generated a whole bunch of favorable letters to Meeker and the PI that or, I put them in the book. And, uh, but the good reverend did not return the money. <laughs> In 1891, he split his company into two parts. Uh, the Puyallup section was under the E. Meeker banner, and the Kent properties got the name Puyallup Hop Company for some strange reason. And it's the Kent properties that we have the most records for. Why he did this is uh, sort of a mystery. I think he did it because he saw trouble coming down the horizon, and he thought that you know maybe this was one way that he could protect himself. Now, I mentioned at the start that he loses everything. What caused that? I, for a long time, I thought it was the story about the Puyallup National Bank. Now, if you don't know the story, very briefly, Ezra was the president of Puyallup National Bank, and it was going to go under. 
and there were a whole lot of uh, creditors, secure, uh, secured creditors, who felt that they were entitled to the money that remained in the vaults. Ezra thought different. He said, no, the depositors are entitled to the money. And so at dark, he closed the bank doors, emptied the vaults, and gave all the money to this guy, Albert Heilig, his attorney. And Heilig went around Puyallup, knocking at doors in the dark with armed guards protecting him, and handed the money back to all the depositors. And when morning came, Ezra closed the doors, and the bank closed for good and went bankrupt, and the secured depositors were just left out in the cold. I mean, the secured creditors were just left out in the cold. I thought, who can save a bank? I mean, I can't. Well, I, when I researching my book, I discovered that the amount of money was $2,400, which for Meeker was chump change. So by 1893, he had hoplites under control, and so what caused his collapse? So all these things up here on the screen, it was kind of a perfect storm. In 1893, the worst depression to hit the United States up to that point occurred. Thousands of people were out of work. Thousands of businesses closed. Banks closed. Meeker was really overextended when this depression hit. He was building a huge hotel in Puyallup, and it went bankrupt. Uh, the light company that he had started to bring electricity to the valley went bankrupt. He had built a light railroad from Puyallup to Tacoma. It went bankrupt. He lost easily a million dollars in today's money in that. Then all the brokers, that, uh, all the farmers that were needing money to, to get what he'd done is he'd loaned farmers to, you know, like he played the banker. And he had two and a half million dollars in loans out. And they couldn't repay him. And Ezra didn't ask either. He, he just wrote it off. But that's two and a half million dollars down the tubes. And then his nephew got involved in a swindle, which I'll tell you about next. And in 1894 to 1896, hop prices collapsed to seven cents a pound, below the cost of production. He wrote out the first two years, but the third year did him in. Let's look at a couple of these things that were individually. This is the hotel. Puyallup had 800 people living in it. It's a rather large hotel for 800 people. It, it went bankrupt. It never even was finished. Uh, it was eventually torn down for scrap. The building in front, the little log thing, that's what's left of his first hop kiln. A major thing that took him down, though, was his light railroad line. The Northern Pacific had a railroad service, you could call it, from Tacoma through Puyallup out to Buckley. And if you were going to Puyallup, you got to ride on a bench in a boxcar. Ezra didn't like that. He said, you know, I've got a lot of really wealthy people coming out here to buy hops and to you know, market and things like that. And so he said, I'm going to build my own railroad, and I'm going to make some money off of it. I'm going to sell land along the railroad. I'm going to buy land. And he, then I'm going to also have this nice hotel where people can stay overnight. And you know, we'll give them tours of the hop fields and stuff. And we will do very well. And he said, I'm going to build the railroad just right down along the Puyallup River on the south side of it, where it's nice and flat. And we'll just go right into Tacoma, no problem. He really underestimated how the Northern Pacific Railroad would react to that. <laughs> they threw up every roadblock that you could imagine. Uh, the story is full of bribery, intrigue, corruption, all of which I tell in the book. Uh, the bottom line is that he was forced to go up over the South Hill. He had to build a whole lot of bridges over ravines. It increased the cost dramatically. And the railroad was finished, but it only lasted a year. And it went bankrupt, partly aided by his nephew's betrayal. So let's get to the nephew. This is Frank Meeker. This is Oliver's son, the one who drowned in, uh, in the sinking of the northerner. When Oliver drowned, Ezra took uh, his wife and his son into their household. And he raised Frank as one of his own. He even sent Frank to Cornell University. I think Frank was the very first graduate from Washington Territory from an Ivy League school. He came back as an attorney, started a hop business, got a job as an editor on the uh, Tacoma Ledger newspaper, and Ezra treated him as his third son. And he put him in charge of his business affairs quite often, including building the railroad. That was an error. 
Frank had a bad side to him. He uh, started selling land along that railroad that he didn't own. And he also mortgaged the railroad's assets and pocketed the money. And he pulled Ezra and the rest of the family into a maze of lawsuits that ultimately they lost at great cost. And he betrayed Ezra. And he really damaged Ezra's reputation. And then he did something that Ezra could not forgive. He got involved with three women at the same time. <laughs> The first one was his wife, Atella Wells Meeker. He married her when he was at Cornell, brought her back to Puyallup. They moved into the Meeker cabin, and they had two kids. For the next 10 years, he had a secret affair going on with Louisa Bance DeWitt, and also with Anna Knox. And the PI said that Frank and Anna were caught in what was called a compromising situation. Anna was fired, and there was talk about maybe there would be a divorce between Atella and Frank, but it didn't happen. And shortly after that, Louisa shot Frank on the streets of Tacoma. And it made front page headlines from Victoria all the way to Los Angeles. <laughs> and it caused the final split between Ezra and the nephew. Now, Frank didn't die. He was laying in bed when he wrote this letter here at the bottom to Ezra. He says, when I was in bed, Fred told me you'd come and see me. Perhaps my inconsiderateness in getting well checked your impulse to come and see me. Or perhaps it was on account of Vitella that you had in mind to come. And so far as your unfriendliness to me is grounded in my ill treatment of Vitella, in my reckless conduct, I fully acknowledge its justice. But as to the Maplewood misfortune, I think you've judged me too harshly. That was the swindle, the land swindle. We only have a picture of uh, Anna. We don't have a picture of the other two women. Meeker lost his properties in 1896 in a bank foreclosure. And a few years later, the Puyallup properties were purchased by a guy named Herman Kleber from Lewis County. And Herman became the new hop king. It was not a crown that you really wanted in your head because here's what happened to Herman. He went to England, uh, to the London Hop Exchange, and he was coming home on a steamship called the Titanic. <laughs> he didn't make it back. So what happened to Ezra? He's 65 years old. He's broke. Uh, there's no social safety net. There's no social security, no 401ks, nothing like that. And so he's going to go start a new business, one that he knew absolutely nothing about. He went up to British Columbia and started a business as a stockbroker of mining claims. And he went to this place called Sandon, and this is what it looked like in 1896. And it's now a ghost town. There's hardly anything there. And while he was there, you know, just dabbling in the mining business, they found gold in the Klondike. And he couldn't resist. And so at age 68, he headed for the Klondike. But he wasn't going up to mine. He was going up to mine the miners. He hauled tons of groceries up over Chilkoot Pass. And he was there in the big avalanche that came down and killed all the people, if you know the story. And he built a grocery store in Dawson City. He sold all his groceries within weeks, went back to Puyallup, got a second load of groceries. In September, he did it all over again. So two times in one year. And he was up there for four years. And I tell this story in my book, Slick as a Mitten. Now, Meeker was back from the Yukon in 1901. He came home for his golden wedding anniversary. And from 1904 to 1905, he and his wife lived in their daughter's home here in Seattle. And this is where he wrote Pioneer Reminiscences, which is the book that he's famous for. And for the last 25 years of his life, no longer a businessman, he cultivated a new persona, that of the old pioneer, champion of the Oregon Trail. It's this image of Meeker that we really know. It was the grand passion of his life. And despite all the setbacks that he encountered over this very long life, just remember he never lost his optimism and never looked back. And he was always a man of the future. And see, this, this is the nation's first RV. <laughs> And guess who had it built? And he traveled all the way around the country on it. Wow.
The covered wagon pioneer of 1852 who helped grow Washington Territory from a wilderness into a state, promote our libraries, schools, and a national road system, was still promoting at the end of his life the future of air travel and motion pictures. This is Ezra in one of his airplane rides. And with or without the help of his fleeting fortune and the acquaintance of five presidents of the United States, he, was, he, he lived a truly remarkable life. This is him with the last president. Well, he actually knew Hoover, Herbert Hoover also. And this is him with Calvin Coolidge. So that's Ezra's story. Wow. The end. Any questions? <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Yeah, way in the back. Yeah, there was the uh, terminals, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad Terminal in Tacoma. Correct me if I'm wrong. When was he able to take advantage of that versus taking the hops down to San Francisco? So um, was he? The, the railroad you're talking about that terminated in Tacoma was the a branch line of the Northern Pacific that was built from Kalama to Tacoma. It okay. didn't connect with anything. It did not? No, not for years. Not till 1883. Okay. It reached Tacoma in the 18, early 1870s, but it didn't connect to anything other than it helped him get his hops to, to Henry Weinhardt down in Portland. But he couldn't take it. But he, he, he couldn't, couldn't get to, he still just needed his sea voyage down to San Francisco until 1883. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where was his family beginning uh, in the East? He came. Where, where did he come from originally? Yeah. yeah. Uh, How the, about that family? Okay. The Meekers originally came from Iowa. Well, the very first Meekers settled in Connecticut, New Jersey, and then they started migrating west, the various from generations England? from England. Mm -hmm. And they ended up in Ohio, where Meeker was born. And then the family moved to Indiana, just outside of Indianapolis. He got married and moved with his wife to Iowa, stayed there for about maybe five or six months. And then in 1852, he headed west over the Oregon Trail. And then the rest of the family started following him out here. Mm -hmm. What about descendants? Are they still in the area? There are a lot of descendants. Um, one, his brother that I showed the picture of, John Valentine Meeker, he had a direct descendant that I worked with for years. His name was Ken Kigley, and he lived to be 101 years old. And he put together a database of 50,000 Meekers. Wow. And when he died, he willed it to me. And so every once in a while, I will get an email from the mansion in Puyallup and said, somebody stopped in this week and they want to know if we're related. <laughs> and I can pretty much manipulate the database to find that out. And the, the latest one was quite humorous. Um, we, we take a yoga class with a guy named Joe Powers, who also teaches out at, uh, at uh, Panorama Village. And I, just as a gift, gave him a copy of the book. And he then told me that he thought he was related to the Meekers. <laughs> and I said, how could you be related to the Meekers? And he said, well, he says, I've got an aunt who married into a Meeker family. And their name was Clyde and Susie Meeker, and they live in Iowa. And he says, I said, well, I'll see what I can find out. I went home, and that night, I traced them all the way back to 1630 in New England. <laughs> So there are there are meekers everywhere. I get them all the time. <laughs> okay, yeah. Wasn't there a special anniversary for meeker, either for a birthday or something, where Congress struck a medal honoring him? In, um, I think you're talking about the coin, the fifty yes, cent the piece. Coin. Yeah. Right. What um, meeker <laughs> spent the last twenty five years of his life trying to save the Oregon Trail. Right. And one of the things that he did along the way was he convinced Congress to mint a memorial coin. Absolutely. And on one side, of the, it's a 50 cent piece. And on one side of the coin is a picture of a covered wagon with a woman and baby in the covered wagon going west toward the sunset. And that was Ezra Meeker and his wife and their baby. And on the other side is a Native American with a map of the Oregon Trail. And that coin they got to sell for a dollar. And the money they made from that went to put up monuments along the trail. Yeah. Do we know, did he have any relationship with George Bush or any of the pioneers or ultimately the Schmidt family? He knew George Bush very well. Uh, he camped out at Bush's place a couple times on his various jaunts around. He spent quite a bit of time here in the Olympia Tumwater area trying to get the people here to put up a monument. <laughs> and it took, you know, 
Chuck Hornbuckle's crew here to finally get that accomplished in 1916. The Daughters of the American Revolution and the Sons of the American Revolution combined to put up a number of monuments in western Washington along the Cowlitz Trail. And they're still standing. Chuck's actually in charge of making them pretty again after all this time. <laughs> yeah, Chuck? Dennis, as a point of information, I had a cousin who, I'm not sure when he was born, but he passed away just a few years ago, but he was going to school at Wenatchee when Edzer was there to sell some of his coins. Hmm. He bought one of the coins, took it home. Not long after that, the house caught on fire. The coin was lost. I have a story about a lost coin. My wife's going to hide. <laughs> we, uh, for, for my retirement from, I was a high school teacher, and when I retired, my wife bought me one of those coins. And it was oh a very nice goodness. coin. You know, and they're pretty expensive. We had our house recarpeted, and if you know that you have to move all the furniture out of the house. And in the process, the coin disappeared. Oh. And for years, we thought the coin had just vanished and, you know, it got put in a box that got sent to the trash or something accidentally. And about six years later, she was dusting the uh, uh, table and there was a little moccasin sitting on the table that we bought on a trip to Canada. And she picked it up to dust it and she turned it over and the coin fell out. <laughs> And she, she, she brought it over to me and she says, Dennis, do you believe in miracles? <laughs> so, so, okay, any other questions? Yeah. Um, my mom used to tell me, sir, she lived in Spanaway about picking hawks. And with your story, I'm guessing that maybe it was my grandmother that picked the hawks. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom was born in 1918. Uh, and she said that... that you really had to be a fast picker because they dried up, you know, you'd look like you had a half a basket and, you know. Yeah, the moisture would go out of them and boom. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah if you got a, a dollar a basket. Yeah, you, know, you, you, you would get that box to the people who were collecting them yeah. as fast as you could. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Anyone else? No connection with the Schmitz then? Um, Ezra was out of the business by the time the Schmitz came around. Uh, the brewers that were here in Olympia that he was connected with were Percival and Wood, the founder of Lacey. And Percival, of course, you know, from Percival Landing here in Olympia. Okay? All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And he is selling books on the back table. Make sure you stop by there and, and grab some of our flyers, too. Next month, our talk is uh, uh, Dave Shipley talking about the historic sites in Thurston County. He has a, a, a brochure he made up about a, a driving tour of the county, and he's going to cover the western half of Thurston County in our talk next month. So we are welcome back. <laughs>